Okay, so welcome everyone um, for the finance committee meeting uh, for the, um, this would be the third quarter. Um, so I think um, today's agenda, we would like to talk a little bit about the tuition prices. We'll go over that first, and then uh, we'll go through the, uh, the five year forecast. So, um, with that, it's, uh, it's six o'clock, so let's get the meeting started. Yes, I don't know, tuition prices, do you want to talk well, about that? And, and, and I, did, I gave the handout to, for, uh, for people to take a look at, and that just has some of the, uh, the those are the nearby um, parochial schools, St. Colin, Kill St. Michael, St. Benedict. I put Holy Family in there because we had a student shadow from Holy Family, and I was just kind of curious as to what their tuition was. And you can see uh, on the elementary and middle school, we're in the ballpark with the, at 2,500, 3,500 for us. St. Colin kills 31, St. Michael's 36, St. Benedict's 39, and Holy Family's 3,000. Um, n note that all those schools have, mu if you have multiple children, now that the discounts, like if it's a second child, it's like fifteen or eighteen hundred dollars less. Um, and like Holy Family, if you have four kids, it's, the fourth kid is free. So th they all have, like, a, they're all scaled. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get to the high school, you know we're at fifty five hundred, uh, which the board uh, uh, actually held an extra year from what their original commitment was when we went back to those prices, which I, we're thankful for, and our numbers are. Our numbers are up tuition wise but you can take a look there trinity is 10-2 uh they list it as 12-5 but they also say that every kid gets a, a certain scholarship for take okay. taking part in their uh internship program uh padua yeah. is 14-2 and yeah. uh um and again every kid is listed at 12-2-5 and they list that every kid gets a scholarship and the same with holy name so uh, you know take that for, and then again they, they have multiple student discounts as well um, and Walsh is 12.7. That's I think that's reflected with with a discount applied to it. So I, I don't know if those come through the diocese, but they all list a grant slash scholarship at, at the high school. So they're not really prices that are listed. It's less than what what's listed there. So um, so that's just a little food for thought. And, and Trinity, Padua, Holy Name are the three kind of closest to us. We know that uh, we know that Ignatius is up in the um, like 14 or 15 thousand dollar range. Um, uh, as is St. Ed's, so, um, yeah. but I, I guess uh, from the competition standpoint, I, I don't necessarily, people are going to go to one of those two places, they're going to, they're not looking at the price or our price versus their price, it's, that's a very oftentimes a specific decision on, on, on those types of things, so we'd always kind of take a look at this as a general reference, and, and originally when I thought, before I ran the numbers, I thought uh, just maybe like $100 across the board, uh, kind of raised to it without being specific and I saw we're, we're kind of in line in the in middle in elementary and then um, so I, I just kind of left it up in the air I wanted to come with a recommendation I really don't I really don't know we're, we're a little bit out of line in the high school we talked I talked with Kathy Martin who who's primarily on the front lines with the collecting and that and and I said well what if we had a 500 of the high school she goes we definitely lose a minimum of three families probably uh, may, maybe a few more than that. We have families that are that have elected to pay us tuition versus taking a voucher and going to a charter school. So okay. they they have free money available to them because of the district that they come from, and they they've opted not to take that free money and instead chose to come here and actually uh, make payments and, and write checks to us and 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 it, and, and some of the, and not. Some of these families are, are are really working hard to have their kids here, yeah. um, and I've had some conversations with them. I met with several families last spring, um, and uh, um, so there's some there's some mechanics on on the accounting end of it that I want to work out with with Welp, Welp, Weltman, Weinberg, and Reese that has done the collections for some other areas on some things, but I I will tell you that I think we've in the last three or four years we've only had one. Kind of default on us. And correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. I'd have to. Uh, but um, I, I, so, while some of them have been a little bit slow, they they they've continued to make payments. They've stayed in communication with us. They've got us money when they could. So, um, so, uh, I, so I, I, I don't know what the feelings of the board are on this. I I, I think I'm kind of thinking because I know that we talked about it the other day too. Why don't we keep it as is for this year? I think this would be my recommendation but look in like really dive into some data 
and, and get some figures, see how many are like multi child families, things like that to see maybe for next year, you know, to propose for next year, which would be the following 21, 22 school year yeah. to it, maybe raise. But, but you know, I, I don't know. I look at like the multi child, you know, having lots of kids like, oh my gosh, these people could be spending upwards of 20 grand plus and we don't give any of those things. And right. I know we did before we gave, you know, like if you're an alumni, if you're this, yeah, you're that. Yeah. But do we look at maybe bringing back some of that? I don't know. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. Here's the other part. And I will tell you procedurally we're going to, because our, our, our numbers are, uh, it, it lists 200, but that includes staff members uh, as 211 tuition students. That's, 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 it's not 211 paying, so I think we're about in the 190 range that are actually paying that are not that would not be staff members kids um but um we were going to hold all the applications to a, a certain date and i i kind of explained this before some of you got here um, we're going to take a look at the classes because it's it's not about that total number it's about where they kind of fit you know we know that we've got a big ninth grade class right now um so i, I would say you know we're not, i wouldn't want to take any more ninth going into tenth grade because uh, that class is so big right now, but we still know that we're in the fifth grade, we're at about 46 or 47 kids. In the third grade, we're still at about 43 kids. So there's some classes there that we right. would, we, it's almost like we kind of want to cherry pick this where we want to put them. I, I've said for a long time that if we can keep our classes in that 60 student size range, we can, we can survive for a long time. It, when we get down into the 40s, uh, it gets a mm -hmm. little bit scary. Just from viability, uh, Matt's got the a number. We'll see in, when we go through the five-year forecast that we're at about six hundred thousand uh, dollars in income from the tuition program. Yeah. That's gone a long way in helping us kind of close the gap on the loss of some of the TP, the phase out of the sure. TPP. So it, I hate to use, I hate to compare that to that, but really, our our, our biggest loss dollars and cents wise is the phase out of the TPP and the increase in tuition is, I hate to say offset it, but it's kind of it has in, on some, in it for a short term. We know that the TPP is going to continue to phase out. We're not going to continue to take tuition kids to balance that out. But for the, the short term here, that's kind of helped us on the balance sheet part of this. What's what's the uh, what's the percentage of our tuition-based students in the high school approximately? Um, high school have got uh, again. These are, this is include staff members. Kids, fifty-four out of. Uh, 285. 285. So we're talking about that. So that's about a little less than six. So it's about 20, 22% or so. It's 30 down in elementary. Like yeah. 33, yeah. right? Yep. Between 30 and 33. Yeah, because yeah, I know it's a so It's, it's right? significant. It's yeah, yeah, it's. it's, it's and, this, and again, this is old data here. Uh, this, yeah. I've got 115 listed in the elementary out of 361. Because you look at the other other schools, and, and uh, academically, I mean, it's like this is a bargain. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a huge Absolutely. Bargain. I mean, in comparison, I mean, it's like it's our, we're half. And we've got well, at million, the high school level, but not level. so much no, K I mean, through eight. Yeah, yeah, and the other the other ones, I mean, we're we're, we're pretty much in a line. But from a high school perspective, I mean, that's right. Yeah, that's, that's, that's there's a lot of data that we want to break out on on our kids and our kids in general and tuition kids in general just 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 the as far as where we're at on achievement gaps and some of those mm -hmm. types of things. Uh, um, and I was going to talk to the board tomorrow night about some uh, some of the test results and some some things that we're seeing test wise that we want to address uh, with some programming. I, I can't. I don't. I don't. You know, I, I can tell you specifically, Joy's working on splitting some data out for us right now. But uh, do you guys I'm like just, the idea of just keeping it as is, or at least recommending? I, I'm, the board a, I'm if okay. You're not ready now, originally, I wasn't. It. I originally I thought we we're, were due to to, to to bump it up, but I, after taking a look at this, and I think you know, for maybe go one more year where we're at, and sit, and then really see what the numbers see what the numbers are. This our our tuition jump was so big mm -hmm. from two years ago to last year um, that. Uh, uh, we we kind of want to see where we're gonna if we level off of that number there and then right. again it's not about the total number it's like where they're fitting in because of some classes we just don't want adding more kids to because of the size of the classes. 
<clears throat> and just to be clear, so how does that work now? Like if a family, or let me back up, at the beginning of the year, if there was a class that was full, but they had a family of kids, it was like all or nothing? We, we, I, we, we have currently have a, at least one family that has one student here and one not here. That okay, because it was full. Right, and that, class okay. was full, we, went, we couldn't take them. I, there, there might have been a couple other occasions where I think we both kids end up getting in, but I know that there's one that, that did not get a second child in, okay. just because of the size of the class. It was really. Yeah. Well, it will be interesting. I think that we could break down the numbers a little bit more to see, like, yeah. maybe what the effect would be, you know, because, um, you know, if, with, with an increase, like you're saying, if there would be families that would, you know, because even a five, $500 you know, increase would, would cause maybe a detriment to some folks. I don't know if that has, what kind of impact. Could you grandfather, could you do like a grandfather we, 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 had, we had originally yeah. talked about, okay. about yeah. that, uh, um, how, how big a headache that would be. Or my, my initial thought was gr they would grandfather through the grade levels that they're in. So if, if they were in the elementary, they wouldn't go to the new rate until they got to middle school. If they're in middle school, they wouldn't go to the new rate until they got to the high school. Uh, um, Kathy Martin says that might be a little bit difficult to manage uh, uh, upstairs. It's doable, but it might be difficult to manage. But th that was what my thought was to say, as long as your kids, stay, you know, if your kid's a second grader, that we're going to maintain that price until they get to sixth grade, and then they'll go to the new rate when they get to the sixth grade mm -hmm. in the middle school. Mm -hmm. okay. Makes sense. Any more conversation on the education? Okay. None, then Matt, uh, it is all yours to go over four kids. Gotcha. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, everybody has in front of them the notes of the five-year forecasts, and I'll pass out the five-year forecasts. I have this, okay. Is it, I have you, right? Yep. Okay. We were talking about it. Oh, I don't have that one. Actually, that's mine. Oh, that's good. I was going to say that's more colors. <laughs> wow. Get the highlighters out on that one. Yeah, I was like, I don't know if you want to get my granddaughter got a hold of that one. That's <laughs> all my tracing. And then this is the May 2019 five year forecast. And that's here. Uh, non color. So just a comparison um, to look at between. November's five-year forecast and May's five-year forecast. Um, the numbers are all reasonable, too. Um, so just you know, a quick glance at the forecast before we jump into the notes. Everything's going to be in the notes. The notes have all the um, support behind them, so we'll go through the notes um, page by page, but we'll go through quickly. <coughs> um, but we can see, you know, just kind of comparing November's five-year forecast to May's five-year forecast. Uh, a new item in November's forecast has fiscal year 24 on it, and we lost fiscal year 16. So on uh, May's five-year forecast, there was the actual column for fiscal year 16, so that's no longer there. Um, everything's bumped uh, one spot left. So we can see for November's five-year forecast, it starts with fiscal year 2017 as the actual, then fiscal 18 actual, and fiscal 19 actual, then the forecast is fiscal 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24. Um, we look at May's five-year forecast, we can see the numbers at the bottom. We're going from 12.9 to 11.9, 10, 7, and 2.9, so trending downward. So no surprise here when we look at fiscal 24, uh, that number is also trending downward all, uh, in effect. So we cross that break-even point where we are deficit spending, which is on line 6.010, shows us our over-under. Um, so for the past three, fiscal years, 17, 18, and 19 in the forecast, uh, our revenues have been greater, higher than our expenses. And now looking ahead, fiscal 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24, our expenses are starting to become higher than our revenues. I, I just, at the end result was we were, because I think we were projected to be deficit spending last year and then we weren't, we ended up right. not, so. Right. Um, so what, what actually would make up the, um, the biggest part of that that drop because you could look at well you know the actual the, the forecast but you're looking at 18 and 19 mm -hmm. is about a, a drop in revenues of about a million mm -hmm. then this year is about a 2.3 million drop and so is that I'm, I'm just trying I haven't looked at the numbers in, in detail up top but well, what's what's attributed to that bigger 1.3 million dollar drop um, if we look at the uh, bottom line for the revenues line 1.0 
excuse me, 1.070 total revenues. Um, yeah. We can see that it was 16.5 and then 16.7 for yeah. fiscal 19. Um, fiscal 20 is almost 16 million flat. And we'll look at that in more depth too of the notes. Um, expenses, if you look at line 4.5, we can see that fiscal 18 had 14 million 67,000 then 14.7 and now we're at 16.4. So there are some conservative estimates in fiscal 20. So okay. for um, repairs and maintenance for the district, we go higher on those, uh, but we may actually not need you know, everything for it. Um, I'll use snow as an example. We estimate a certain amount for rock salt and you know, snow melt you know, materials. We may not have to use all that if we have a mild winter. So we estimate higher, that's thrown in the column for fiscal 20. Lexi won't be happy if that happens. But our actuals may be smaller. No, so. For you. <laughs> so there are some conservative numbers there, but we'll go through and take a look at everything. Um, you know, but this just you know, lets us know that uh, you know, the TPP phase out has happened. You know, we're losing 213,000 per year. Um, our salaries you know, for the district, we know those go up by step increases and the two collective bargaining agreements are expiring after fiscal 20. Um, health insurance costs continue to rise um, you know, because of HB 920, we'll look at it in the notes. Um, property taxes are essentially flat. There is some little uh, movement available with some other options um, there, but um, you know, the TPP is the largest you know, number that we're looking at as it's been decreasing by about 213,000 per year. Um, that's been affecting our revenues. Um, Mr. Evans is correct. Uh, on the short term, tuition students, you know, we'll look at those numbers too, have you know, made it a little more stable, I guess you can call it. Um, but it's not gonna, you know, we're not gonna see a greater influx of tuition students. So, um, you know, the need for an operating levy, um, as well as another levy to look at for renovations that we've been talking about. It's, you know, but we're going to look at the um, tax rates of Cuyahoga County, us compared to other districts too. So we'll go through everything. And, you know, the numbers are what they are as they're coming out. So, um, but, you know, looking at it, you know, with an optimistic uh, viewpoint, you know, we've been trending upward. We're at our highest point, you know, at the end of fiscal 19, uh, line 7.020 with our cash balance. Uh, so fiscal 19 was 13.8 million. Um, you know, so we're at a really stable point now. It's just we have to, you know, just be very mindful and watchful and you know, keep our eye on everything. Um, so I'll jump into the notes of the forecast if there aren't any questions. Um, so this first page, um, there aren't really any changes on the first page um, from the May 2019 forecast to the November uh, forecast. But the first page just has kind of the introduction um, that we can see. Um, the one difference I do want to point out on this page is in the first paragraph, um, towards the middle, it says the initial five-year for, uh, forecast must be submitted by October 31st of each year. This date will change to November 30th, beginning 2019, because of Senate Bill 216, which took effect on November 2nd, 2018. Uh, so that was the big change. So this forecast used to be the October forecast, now, because of the law change, it's the November five-year forecast. And the reasoning behind that is because many districts are on the ballot today and they would ask them to do a forecast book. Mm -hmm. They submit a forecast a month before they're on the ballot and, and, and making its accuracy <laughs> somewhat suspect because they didn't know whether or not issues were going to pass or not. So, um, We have our title page on page two. Uh, page three talks about the nature of the forecast. Page four talks about the budgetary process. Page, the next couple pages just talks about the uh, five-year forecast categories and line numbers in more detail. So five, six, seven, and eight. Uh, page nine is the embedded November 2019 five-year forecast in the forecast. The small lettering. It's very small. <laughs> I was trying to get everything on one page. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, 
So page 10 starts on the first line of the five-year forecast, which is general property taxes, <coughs> line 1.010. Um, just want to highlight a couple things on this page. In the blue uh, font, we can see that real property is divided into two classes, class one, which is residential and agriculture, and class two, which is commercial, industrial, and all the real property in general. So when we talk about class one and class two, uh, we know that class one is res ag, residential, agriculture, and then class two is commercial, industrial, and all others, so. I thought you were saying a term that was like a different no, language. Just a <laughs> um, and then down at Treasure the, talk. The, res ag. Down at the, uh, you're gonna use that now, down at the second half of the sheet. Um, I put a couple new things in here. So for the tax year column, um, I have a little star asterisk uh, for triennial, and two stars uh, asterisks is for reappraisal. So we can see which years had the triennial update and reappraisal by the county um, to assess the tax er, the valuations. Um, then look at the fiscal year column. So I have how the fiscal years are impacted by which tax years there are. So tax year 18 affects fiscal year 19 and 20. So the first half of second half because our fiscal year is 7 1 to 6 30. Um, and then I also want to point out the collection percentage of levy very last column um, so we can see the past seven years what our collection percentage is and this is very important because this tells us how much money from the levies that we're collecting that is not delinquent. So uh, tax year 18 was 96 percent then 95, 97, 96 and 89. 91. So each percentage point is about two to three hundred thousand dollars. So it's very significant. And just just a note, the the reevaluate. It's nice that the reevaluation that, that values have gone up, but 920 adjusts that. 920 says we can't collect more than what the voted the approved amount was. So mm -hmm. essentially, while the Valuations have gone up. We don't collect any more money. We do collect some more money on new builds and some things like that. But we don't, even though the the reevaluation with the property values going up is is a good thing for our communities. It doesn't. We we don't get a real positive impact from that as a school district due to House Bill 920. Okay. Well, the collection percentage sure helped. Out. Yeah, that's that, that's, that's, that's huge. Massive. The fact that we're the collected at 96.7 percent was a. Four hundred thousand dollar jump. Yeah. We don't know 2019's tax year collection percentage yet, which will impact the second half of fiscal 20. So we know one half of fiscal 20, but we don't know the second half of fiscal 20. Um, turning to the next page, page 11, has a listing of levies, different types. Uh, page 12 uh, talks about um, the use as definition and receipt codes. Then we get to House Bill 920. Uh, it went into effect in 1976. Um, so I'll read it. This credit effectively freezes all voted real property millage at the dollar amount collected the first year the millage went to effect. Um, as property values rise through reappraisals, outside millage rate is commonly referred to as effective millage. We'll look at this at you know, more detail. Uh, the inside mills are not affected by House Bill 920 credit, so a small amount of additional revenue is gained as property values increase for inside millage. And we'll look at that too. Um, then we have you know, millage and we have effective millage highlighted, if anybody's curious about the question. 20 mill floor at the bottom. Um, page 13, we have accounting for general property taxes. Um, the bottom has a uh, you know, good highlighted chart of tax and collection year information so we can see uh, the future tax years and when the triennial update is going to occur by the county and tax year 21. And we can see the tax years that affect fiscal years. So highlighted in blue is fiscal 20, so that's both tax year 2018 and tax year 2019. Uh, going to page 14, uh, we start looking at the numbers for our current levies. Um, so the top half of the page has all of our current levies. So we can see that we get a certain portion of inside millage. And if you look at that tax rate column for inside mills, we get 4.1. So that's an amount just given to us by the county. To use it to start the school district. So they're saying 
you know, of the 10 mills that's allocated, you know, to the city or village and the school district, you know, pick library, other entities, the school, you get 4.1 to run your school district. And then after that, if you, you know, the school district wants any more money, then you have to go out to the voters, which is called outside monies. And then you throw those outside monies on. So, so we can see for us, we have continuing operating, which um, goes on forever. And we can see all in which the years improve for those levies. So they lump everything together for 1976. Uh, so we can see 81, 88, 91, 97, 2003, and the most recent levy that we had, which was 2012. And then we can see the tax rate um, for each one of those levies. So when we went out in 2012, that levy was 7.9 mills, which is the tax rate. Then we can see the tax year 2017 and tax year 2018 blue columns, and that's the effective rate. So House Bill 920 says that you know, when it was passed, that's what the amount effectively stays at. So these are adjusted year to year, these effective tax rates, um, to get you close to the dollar amount in which those levies were generated when they were voted in. So you're always gonna see a change in that. And the bottom numbers indicate that 20 mil floor. So if it ever gets to 20 mils with an effective rate, um, that's how that works. And, but we're nowhere close, so we don't have to worry about it. That's why I like part of 1976, you didn't see school districts on the ballot as often because as home values increased, the schools got more money yeah. because the, the, it was allowed to grow. Uh, 920 effectively eliminated that. So since 1976, that's the, the that's why you see so many districts on the ballot so often because the uh, it, that was the time that the, the state government put a stop to the to the growth of the uh, the, the millage. So it's kind of like inflation with the tax rates. So we can see for 1981, you know, we had a three mill levy that was put on, and we can see the effective mills of 2.2 and then 2.6 for each of the different classes. So it's not quite three has to be dropped to that point to still collect that same amount of money. Now as we get closer to um, current, so 2012, it's almost at 7.9 because inflation hasn't really hit that 2012 year as it has for, you know, way back to 1981. So. Does the inside mill it stays the change? same always? It's no. always flat. Yep. So that's where we uh, see an increase in money if the valuation goes up because you're multiplying it by that fixed inside mill it stayed, it stayed the same. Stayed. Right, <laughs> because that was what they, when they, when they, that was the original amount that schools were given yeah. um, uh, when this, the whole structure was set up. So that that would nine twenty did not apply to the to the inside millage. So what they, what they wouldn't adjust for like inflation rates or anything no. like that to give that, that that's that allowed price. to grow. Wow. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm blown away. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we're always going to see a, uh, a different effective rate for tax years. You can see tax years 17 and 18. The amounts differ a slight amount, so that's always going to change because the valuation changes. So they try to keep the same dollar amount the same um, when the valuation changes because of that. Okay. Um, the bottom half of the page, uh, this is new. This is our actual levy collection information. So I have two years, tax year 18 and tax year 17. So on those long tax sheets that I do every month, this is the bottom right-hand corner. And the next long tax sheet we'll look at more in depth and trace it back, but um, I have little boxes that are colored around some of these figures that are gonna trace in the next couple pages that we have to make it easier to see. But um, for tax year 18, which is half of fiscal 19 and half of fiscal 20, um, we can see you know, the amounts of class one and two that we received and the total. We can see how the levy gives us three different colors, blue, pink, Blue is class one and two, pink is our public utility personal property, and green is homestead and our rollback credits, which we'll talk about more after. When we add up uh, the two columns, we get 11,837,716, and the levy at estimated 100% collection is about 12.2 million, so our collection <coughs> percentage is nine, uh, excuse me, 96.7, which goes back to that one page we were looking at with the collection percentages um, where we're at 96.7. So that's how that traces um, back. So that's what we actually collected. Of that, we can see how much is within class one and two, the blue, how much is for public utility, personal property, the pink, how much is for homestead. Can I roll back credits? No. Okay, green. Um, so this is for 2018 and 2017, just as a comparison. So if we go to page 15, um, 
this has more information. So the very top chart, uh, top half, has again all of our levies. So the inside millage and then all of the levies that we have. So we have our tax rate, then we have our effective rate for 2018, and then A, B, and C shows us the actual money coming in for the district for those different columns. So class A, those are all the amounts that we get for that tax levy for 2018. Column B, which is class two, um, those are all the amounts that we collect on the levy uh, for that year, 2018. C, public utility, personal property, we'll get to that more, that's a different section. But then they all roll up and add A, B, and C to that estimated tax revenue at 100%, which is our $12.2 million amount in the box that we have. And then remember, we're collecting uh, at 96.7 for that year, so that's our 11 million. Um, the middle chart just has our valuation, um, you know, plugged in with our different collection percentages that we can see. And I think the bottom half, uh, the very bottom chart that we have is a really cool chart. It's tax year 2018 Cuyahoga County tax rates. So we can see for us, it's a green box around it. We're at 35.7 when we add up all of our um, tax rates for our levies. But look at some of the other school districts in Cuyahoga County, just how much higher they are. Cuyahoga Heights is the lowest. So imagine if, you know, are we ever going to get to Cleveland Heights, University Heights, 100? <laughs> I don't think so. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, so, I mean, Shaker Heights, if you live in that you know, community, I mean, you're paying a lot of taxes for the school district, 190.4. So we're, I mean, we're, you know, low by a large amount compared to other school districts. So, I mean, us and Independence are neck and neck for the lowest, but after that, I mean... The next closest is Brooklyn at 58.7. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. 